So welcome everyone to our first speaker event in the Empowered by Halcyon Taking Actions series. This is an exciting new event at Halcyon that aims to support young people in going out into the world as responsible global citizens, encouraging us all to seek knowledge and take ownership of our actions and embrace difficult conversations with courage. We are honored to be joined this evening by Dr. Ava Thorne. Dr. Thorne works on policy and technology in the developing world as well as, as well as COVID vaccines and treatment for developing countries for the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. It is a privilege to welcome you tonight, Eva, and we're very excited to hear your thoughts and knowledge in service of social justice. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Please feel free to keep your cameras on and microphones muted. There will be time at the end of the lecture for the Q&A and this session will be recorded. Thank you very much. I'm really quite flattered that you asked me and I'm excited to be the, the first speaker. So I do have some slides and I'm going to do a brief presentation and I want to leave as much time as possible for discussion, especially with any of the students who are on the line. So the title obviously is Knowledge in the Service of Social Justice and it really is about moving from ideas to action. And I was asked to share about my personal journey in terms of how I've arrived at the kind of work that I've done. And I thought about this in the context of the Halcyon students who are very bright and inquisitive and how might some of the things that students are learning help them think about what they could do to make the world a better place. So the presentation is in two parts. First, what I'm currently doing. And then the second is the somewhat circuitous route to explain how I got to where I am. So where I am currently, and I know he's a bit of a lightning rod for some, but I, this is a photo of the right honorable Tony Blair. For younger students who may not know, he was the prime minister of the United Kingdom between 1997 and 2007. And currently, Tony is the executive chair of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, which is where I have worked in different capacities for the past seven or eight years or so. So just very briefly about what the Institute does, it's divided into two parts. Since Tony was a prime minister, he's very much about the machinery of government, which I thought would be incredibly boring until I actually started working within governments in developing countries and saw how incredibly exciting and rewarding it could be to make institutions work for the public good in meaningful ways where you have huge impact on very large numbers of people. So at the Institute, there are two parts of our work. One is about government advisory. And so this involves working at the top of government with prime ministers and presidents senior ministers, so the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Health, the Minister for Trade and Investment. And this is about helping leaders, especially in developing countries, take their ideas in the context of relatively limited resources and turn those ideas into plans and ways to actually deliver. So it might be delivering a road that's needed to help small producers get their products to market or it might be delivering foreign investment to create a really cool tech hub for up and coming tech entrepreneurs, or it might be delivering universal health to pregnant women. Those are just some examples. The policy team takes on public policy, but it's policy that is politically actionable and that's not pie in the sky, but it's very, very doable. So you can see that the mission is to support leaders and governments to build open, inclusive, and prosperous societies in a global world. Pretty much every organization nowadays has been forced by the pandemic to do something to deal with the COVID crisis. And the Tony Blair Institute is no different in this regard. So last year, just as we were going into lockdown, Tony called a, a meeting of all the staff and said, we've got to pivot, we're in at least 23, 24 countries. I'm already being flooded with calls from leaders. What can we do to help? And there were several areas where we were providing help. One was government advisory, expert support. And that really was how do you work in a context where the government doesn't have a lot of resources to provide 
budgetary support for people who are losing their jobs. We've developed practical tools and resources. So I've got all these cases coming in. They're coming in from different parts of the country. I don't have a centralized ministry to work with this. How can we stand up some kind of a crisis response unit? We did that during Ebola a few years ago, and we've done it in some places in Africa in the context of, of COVID. The third thing, many of you will have seen or you read or saw reports in the newspapers in the UK, the US, all over Europe, where you saw doctors and nurses reusing the same masks over and over because they didn't have enough or they were reusing gloves, or they were asking people to make masks. So the whole issue of PPP, personal protective equipment, was even more acute in terms of the shortage in developing countries. And we started doing a lot of work to facilitate helping public health systems procure those resources so that the frontline health workers could be properly protected. More recently, we've been working on the issue of medical oxygen. As you know, many people with COVID end up in the hospital, they need medical oxygen. It's a shortage in some rich countries, but it's an acute crisis in many poor countries. And that's something that we've provided support on. And finally, providing support to government through analysis and policy. And this ties into how my own personal has, work has changed in the context of the COVID crisis at Tony Blair Institute, TBI. So I've been doing a lot of the work on COVID vaccines and COVID therapeutics. So the kinds of drugs that can help people who have COVID and treat the symptoms. The focus on the COVID-19 vaccine work has really been heavily focused on the hard and very difficult reality that poorer countries in Latin America, Africa, some parts of Asia just don't have vaccine access. So there's a global facility called COVAX, which is theoretically supposed to be bulk buying. So buying hundreds of millions of doses specifically for poorer countries. What's happened is that many of the rich countries, because they have the money to do so, have been able to go directly to Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and negotiate hundreds of millions of dollars of vaccine purchases bypassing this international facility, which means that the poorer countries that are dependent on getting their vaccines through COVAX kind of go to the back of the line because the drug companies would prefer to get higher prices for the drugs directly from governments that can pay up front, as opposed to COVAX, which is a donor funded. So governments fund it, the Gates Foundation, other organizations fund it. And so what you have now is a situation where even though places like the EU are seeing very slow vaccination rollout, most rich countries have five, six, seven, eight doses per person. You need basically two unless you're getting the Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine. Whereas maybe 2%, 3% of Africa has been vaccinated. I think it's like one. And the numbers in places like Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Latin America are also quite low. So I've been doing a lot of work on that, which to me is very much a, a use of ideas around how do we think about issues of global inequality. I know many of you are looking at issues of inequality in economics courses, for example. And so this would be an example of what can we do to address vaccine inequality with the understanding that if people have COVID in a developing country and somehow they get on a plane, we're going to get infected as well. So how do you make those kinds of arguments about vaccine equity? What I'm supposed to be doing, and it's been put on cold because of COVID, is work around how technology can help developing countries to leapfrog the development process. So all of you who are looking at history or you're studying economics and how countries go from being poor to rich, you'll see that they start out doing agriculture. So people are farming. Then they might have the easy phase of industrialization where they are making canned foods or they're making clothes. Then they want to move up the value chain and start producing heavy machinery like washing machines and cars. And then they want to leapfrog from there into making technology and becoming a knowledge economy or a service economy. So the question on the table for poorer countries is, will the fourth industrial revolution, which is the, basically the, the technology revolution, allow poorer countries to take advantage of technology 
so that they can go quickly past those earlier phases of development and reach a higher standard of living by unlocking the power of blockchain, of mobile money, et cetera. So that's what I'm supposed to be doing, but that's sort of in on hold now as I work on, on COVID. But you can see that they're both initiatives that are about how can those who have less have more? So there's an, a concern that I have about equity. So just really briefly, this is a little bit out of date, but this is a, a map of where we work and where we have worked. So we're currently in 19 countries in Africa. We've worked in Southeast Asia and we're currently scoping there now. And we've also, we're working in Europe as well. So it's a pretty broad footprint that we have. The other thing that I'm currently doing now outside of work is board service. So I'm on the board of directors of, a, of an advocacy organization. It's called Malaria No More UK. And as the title of the organization implies, it's a, an organization that's devoted to stopping malaria. We know that nets work. We know that other kinds of mechanisms can work, spraying with... Um, pesticides that don't have the, the damaging chemicals, we know what works to stop malaria. So what Malaria No More UK does is try to bring attention to the issue of malaria, much more challenging now since everything is focused on COVID and the funding that governments like the UK government, the American government, the EU governments would normally provide for malaria prevention programs in countries in Latin America, Asia and Africa where malaria is a problem, some of that money has been cut. So you hear about funding cuts. And because COVID is a crisis, the concern is that some of the money that would normally go for malaria prevention programs is going to deal with COVID. So I'm on the board of directors and this is a picture here of, of David Beckham, the football star who is one of our global ambassadors. So there are different ways that you can use your skills and talents. And the reason why I was asked to be on the board was because I've worked so much with governments in developing countries where malaria is an issue. And it's something that I, I saw and I had to take anti-malarial pills for the time spent in Latin America and the time I spent in Africa. And it was an issue that was important to me. And while I'm not directly working on advocacy, because that's what the staff members do as a board member, I can help the organization think about strategy, think about communications, think about messaging, think about how they can talk to donors, because I have experience with that because of research that I did on the World Bank. So those are the kinds of ways that my training and education have been helpful in the context of an organization like Malaria No More UK. So that's what I'm currently doing. And so the, the issue is how I got to where I am now. And it's a, a story that goes through four continents. So I'm a native New Yorker. I'm from Brooklyn. And I went to school in Manhattan at um, a math and science focused high school. And I had the idea in my head that I was going to be a doctor. I thought I was going to be a surgeon. I was really into math and science. And once I left New York for school, I went to Cambridge, Massachusetts. I did my undergraduate degree in history at Harvard University and spent the next 20 some odd years of my life between Cambridge and Boston. I did my undergraduate degree at Harvard in history. I took two years off after college and I worked in community organizing, focused on lead poisoning prevention, which was both a public health and an environmental issue. And then I did public relations for a hospital before I started graduate school at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I did a doctorate in political science focused on political economy and developing countries with initial focus on Latin America. So in graduate school, I spent a year in Brazil where I did my field work. I was looking at, and I'll say more about this in a few slides, I was looking at the World Bank, which is a big development organization that gets funding from rich country governments and provides money for things like schools and health programs and roads and infrastructure. Infrastructure helps countries to develop quickly economically. 
And at the time that I was in graduate school, the bank was funding lots of dams in places in like India and Brazil. And I became very interested in that. And I also did a lot of work in Central America, which I'll talk about shortly. Then through some steps, which I'll talk about, I ended up working in West Africa, living in West Africa, specifically Liberia, where I spent two years through Africa Governance Initiative, which was one of Tony Blair's organizations. And in Liberia, I worked with the president of the country who at that point was the country's first female, well, Africa's first elected female head of state, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and senior ministers and my Liberian counterpart to help Liberia reform the petroleum sector. So working to help them get a better petroleum law, a new petroleum law that would deal with environmental issues, that would deal with public participation, that would deal with corruption by having transparency and more accountability, et cetera. I wasn't keen on working on oil and gas because of the issue of climate change, but I also understood the hard reality that poorer countries would be likely to exploit their resources because they didn't think they had anything else. And so it was sort of like a harm reduction strategy. And after two years, the country of Liberia and the, west of the, the rest of the regions, uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone, had an outbreak of Ebola and Brooks's International School there closed. So Tony, Tony Blair asked me to come to London and to restructure the policy and research unit of his then commercial business, which he has since closed down and put everything into the Tony Blair Institute, which is not for profit. But the policy and research work took everything that I learned in school, which was very pie in the sky and made it really practical. So we worked with governments that would say, I want to reform my education program. What should I do? Or they would ask questions like, we want to do better investments in technology so we can build up our economy that way. Who's doing the best work and what route should we take? So it's taking all that political science-y stuff, all that learning about development, and using it in a practical way so that millions of people could benefit. So ideas into action. So in terms of how I started, my own journey started when I was really young. And I'm, you can kind of tell how old I am when I say this, but one of my first memories in life was of the end of the Vietnam War, which was in the mid 1970s. And this is a picture of children who were Vietnamese orphans who were going to be airlifted and adopted by American families. And I remember being three or four watching TV and seeing these commercials of Vietnamese orphans and the call for American families to adopt them. And I can remember being in my living room and crying and going to my parents and begging them to adopt a Vietnamese orphan because I thought, not right that they're orphans, not right that they don't have parents. We have a nice home. Why can't my mother and father adopt a child? I didn't understand anything about the Vietnam War. I just knew that something wasn't right and I was bothered by it. The second relevant memory is when I was 11 and my family took a vacation to Guatemala. My mom had read an article about Guatemala in the New York Times. I was learning Spanish in school. Let's take a vacation. So the picture on the upper right is Lake Atitlan, which is, you can see, absolutely beautiful. The picture doesn't do it justice. And the picture down here is of Guatemalan indigenous children. Guatemala is in Central America and is a majority, if you look at the census, which calculates how many people are in a country, majority indigenous and they're poor. The country has suffered from war and the condition of the country's indigenous community is really bad. We were there on a nice upscale vacation, private tours, nice hotel, but I was bothered by what I saw. And so when you're thinking about what can I do, what can I do to make a difference, you can ask yourself some questions. What do I love? What do I see that bothers me? What makes me angry in the world? I was bothered by seeing orphans. I was angered by the condition of these indigenous people. I didn't put it together when I was 
four or 11, that this would translate into some kind of action. But these are things that struck me and stuck with me. And in hindsight, now that I'm an adult, I recognize that those things that bothered me, made me angry, things that I loved, sowed the seeds for how I would think about how to use ideas and things that I was learning to try to do something to make a difference in the world. So fast forward to when I did my undergraduate degree at Harvard University, I didn't really have any big clear ideas about social justice. Many of you students at Halcyon are doing much more as teenagers than I ever thought to do. And when I was going to college, the big issue was the apartheid movement in South Africa. So apartheid, I know some of you, in, in at least in grade 10, you're learning about the civil rights movement. So you learned about segregation and Jim Crow, Plessy versus Fer Ferguson, et cetera. South Africa had a similar system where you had something called white minority rule and there were formal and informal means of separating the minority white population from the majority black population that led to injustices. So you've heard names like Nelson Mandela or Oliver Tambo or Winnie Mandela or Walter Sisulu or Bishop Desmond Tutu, all kind of heroes of the anti-apartheid movement. And Harvard at the time was investing in companies that had ties to South Africa. So as a student, I became involved in the, what we called the E for D movement, education for divestment. So those were some of the protests that you can see there. And I also became involved in a local food pantry in a poor neighborhood in Roxbury. And my questions were getting a little sharper. I was studying sociology. I was taking gov classes, government classes. I was taking history classes where we were looking at some of these issues, US social history, where we looked at poverty and anti-poverty programs or diplomatic history where US intervention in other countries was looked at. And so questions of fairness started to become sharper in my 18, 19, 20, 21 year old brain. Medical school went out the window and I was all about social sciences and humanities. And I was wondering, is this fair? Apartheid's not fair. Does it have to be the case that people really need to be hungry in a country as rich as the United States? Mm, probably not. Is there something that I can do at an individual level? I can make my voice heard about Harvard not investing in South Africa. I can certainly volunteer on a Saturday and go to the feed food, free food program. And that's where I was in my early 20s. Then graduate school, where I started my program at MIT, was the turning point. And here's where you've heard the expression, maybe the personal is political. And that was very, very true in my own experience. So this is a picture of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's a view from Roanoke, Virginia. It's not my family's property, but it's very near where we have property that my maternal great grandfather, who was a slave, was able to acquire property. And my family has struggled to hold on to it in the face of development. So the power company wanted a piece, the Explore Park wanted to come and turn it into a a, a riverway, because a river runs through our property for canoeing and wanted to take the land from us essentially for development purposes. And my family has been trying to hold on to it. It's beautiful. It's got wild turkeys and deer and black walnut trees. And we don't live there anymore, but we still have the property. And the issue of land loss, especially amongst Blacks with roots in the South, who came into land the way my family did, became really personal for me. And in graduate school, I wasn't interested in studying domestic US politics. I was really drawn to developing countries and became very interested in and enamored of Brazil because I was looking at the World Bank, which I mentioned before. I oddly became obsessed with the issue of dams because dams that the World Bank was funding was were they were displacing hundreds of thousands of people. 
they were destroying beautiful, pristine areas in China and in Indonesia and Brazil. And I decided I was going to do my field work in Brazil. So I went and lived in Brazil for a year. And one of the places that I went, the bottom left and the bottom right pictures, it's the Kalunga community in the state of Goyas, which you might not be able to see it here. It's a few states below the legal Amazon. And no electricity, no running water, no roads. I had to ride eight hours on horseback between uh, several men. They were in the family armed because there was rural violence. And I wanted to go to this community because they were going to be flooded out by a dam. And that felt really political and it felt personal because what I saw in my family struggle to hold on to our property in Virginia seemed very similar to what was going on in the Kalunga community. And this community was, a, as I said, descendants of escaped slaves called the Quilombola. They had been living in this community since the late 1600s. And now they were going to be faced with eviction by a large dam that was being funded with money from the World Bank. And I was looking at the World Bank's policies on involuntary resettlement and indigenous peoples. So you can see like a really direct connection there are these ideas about how you do resettlement. There are international conventions on indigenous rights, the International Labor Organization Convention 169. What does that mean in practice? It means that indigenous people should have rights to their land. They should have land titles if they've been in the area for a certain period of time uninterrupted. And here it was in the flesh in this Kalunga community in Brazil. And I had my own odd variation of it with my family's land in Virginia. So there's something that was really personal, but I could make a connection to my research and I could see those ideas playing out in practical ways. Like how can we use some of these conventions to help? Closer to home, I wanted to keep my foot in the activism door. And so this is a picture, especially for your, the grade 10 students who are looking at the civil rights movement, these are people who participated in the very famous 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer. You had lots of Northerners that went to the American South to Mississippi to do voter registration. And in 1994, when I was a few years into graduate school, I became involved in a project called Boston Freedom Summer, which invited college educated students come to Boston, work in underserved communities, and work in community-based organizations, the Codman Square Health Center, the Four Corners Action League, to build the capacity of community-based organizations to serve a poor neighborhood that was struggling with gang infestation and poverty. And so I had studied Miss Mississippi Freedom Summer. I saw eyes on the prize. I read Poor People's Movement. I read local organizers. I read all of the literature on the civil rights movement. They were ideas about fairness and justice, standing in solidarity with the local community. I wanted to live those ideas and working with Boston Freedom Summer was a way to take what I had learned about the civil rights movement and make it real and practical in the context of 1994, poor inner city community that needed support. Fast forward to the Garifuna. I'll, I'm going to end very quickly because I know we, we need to have some time for discussion. I spent a lot of time on the Atlantic coast of Central America because I got deep into this issue of land rights and worked on the issue of racial identity. And these are people who are an Afro Amerindian people. They speak Garifuna. Their lands are, are being invaded by development projects. They live on the coast, so there are resources there. And I spent time working on land rights. So all that stuff around indigenous land rights, bring it down to practicality, work with and through local organizations on the Atlantic coast of Central America to help those communities actually file land claims to get their titles. So the point I wanna make is that if you look over the trajectory of my life, the ideas that motivated me move across borders. And I've worked with governments in, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Ethiopia, Mozambique. I've worked with companies such as Petronas, which is the national oil company of Malaysia. The picture here on the bottom right is of Mount Nimba in Guinea. I spent time there. A mining company wanted to do some surveying of social and environmental issues. I spent time in Cambodia. 
with a civil society group that wanted to pressure the government to disclose all the money that it was getting from oil and gas contracts to make sure the money wasn't being stolen so that the Cambodian people would benefit. So if you step back from those experiences individually, I think what unites them is that whatever the context, my own personal journey has really been about promoting greater access to resources for those who don't have them. So it's the same concern. I've addressed it from different perspectives government, civil society, and as an individual, and through companies. So the last thing that I'll say is your path will evolve, and that's okay. Mine has evolved into different areas as I've grown, and my commitments have stayed the same, but how I've worked them out has changed over time. And I'll just leave you with this, just to summarize. It's a journey. Ask yourself some questions. What do you love? What makes you angry, annoyed, or frustrated? Start where you are and don't worry about the big picture. Assess the fit of what you're doing. Try things out. Are you engaged? Do you find yourself wanting to learn more? Are you excited to participate in that activity again? Do you feel passionate about it? If not, it's not for you. You have to find what makes sense and what you're passionate about. Keep coming back to the why of what you're doing. And Brooks would kill me, but I just thought I would end this. The, our first year with the organization, we had a, a, a Christmas party, and Tony took that picture with Brooks, and then more recently, they took a selfie together. So I will stop there and open it up for any questions that you might have or comments. Oh, thank you. Um, Eva, for such an insightful and thought-provoking lecture. I'm, I'm, whenever I talk to you, I'm in constant awe of everything that you've achieved and you will continue to do. You're good for um, my ego. <laughs> um, I was wondering, actually, if you could just explain some of the challenges that you have faced um, from start to end of some of the projects that you've been involved in. I think the biggest challenge is if you're working in a community that's not your own, you have to be respectful, you have to be invited, you have to respect local talent and leadership, and you have to work in partnership with their priorities, their interests, and go in with a heart of humility where you're there to learn and you're there to serve. You're not there to run, dominate, rule, or order around. And I think that that's something that I've tried to have guide all of the, the work that I've done. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience that would like to ask a question, please feel free. Oh, Brooks is um, Eva's son. He's a grade 10 student at Halcyon. Um, Eva, could you perhaps show the last slide again? Yes. Present now a window. Is it a window? Yes, a window. Share. There. <laughs> That's the last slide. Oh, I think it was probably the one before. The questions. This one, <clears throat> that one. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Were there questions about this? I have actually, actually have another question um, and it's more from my own um, trying uh, understanding generally when people um, give money um, to charitable organizations the question always arises of how much of that money actually goes to those in need um, or when you put money into projects that are helping in other countries can you speak a bit about that and maybe how much of that you've seen go into where it needs to go that's a good question so 
when I make assessments about that, I always, you kind of have to dig a little, and I always look if I see, <clears throat> excuse me, 50% going to overhead or 50, 60% going to salaries, I don't give. I'm looking for, and I think a good rule of thumb, <clears throat> you want as much of the donation to be going to actual program. So you want an organization that's working to keep the overheads, how they pay for the lights, how they pay for the, the rent, you want that kept low. And you want your donation to go directly to those in need. So usually they're, a nonprofit is forced to disclose those kinds of things. So you kind of have to do a little bit of, of homework, but it certainly is an issue. And we certainly have seen a number of organizations where donations have gone not for program, not for people, but more for marketing or comms or salaries. And those are organizations that you, you want to avoid, definitely. Thank you. Steph, would you like to ask your question? Hi, thank you for your really interesting talk. Um, I had a question, um, I guess aimed at for the students really. Um, I found it really interesting that you've carried on with your activism as well as working from the inside to make change. Do you think that one or the other approach is more effective in bringing about change or should students just go for whichever option they feel they most enjoy? I think when you're, you're 13, 14, 15, 16, you just need to try different things. I... I don't think that I would advocate getting locked into one or another. Some people might be better suited to weekend warrior activism. There's nothing wrong with that. Or maybe they find a way to make activism their life's work in a way that feeds their souls and can pay their bills, and that's great. I think it really is trial and error and experimentation because you know 13 14 15 67 you're learning and growing all the time and what interests you will likely change so i think it's i i would probably just advise broad exposure to a variety of options and then just kind of seeing what you're drawn to i think for me because i i like to stay engaged and involved I've tried to find a way to do meaningful work that will pay my bills, but also has some kind of a make the world a better place component and still like to keep busy outside work as well. So it was important for me to be able to do both. Rita, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um... Thank you. That really inspiring and interesting talk, as everyone has said. Um, I'm just wondering, what would you advise a young person who gets pressure either from their peers or their family about, you know, getting, um, you know, a real job, you know, where you are, you know, a professional job. I'm not saying I feel that way. I'm just That's saying okay. there's a lot of pressure out there on young people to, you um, you know, unfortunately, we live in a very capitalistic society. Uh, well, fortunately, unfortunately, that's a whole other thing. Won't <laughs> um, but I'm just saying there is pressure on on young people. You know, what are you going to do with that college degree? Or what are you going to do if you don't go to college? So I'm just wondering if you have, if you ever received such pressure and, um, you know, and how you would, and, you know, especially in your earlier stages, how you would recommend uh, or advise young people stick to what they're looking, you know, till they find their passion, as you say. It's a really good question. So when I graduated from college, we were going into a recession. And I was grateful to just get any job, you know, and I, I happened to end up working for Lead Free Kids, which was doing organizing with landlords around lead poisoning prevention. So it, it had an organizing and a social justice component. I would say if you're you're being pressured by parents, don't waste don't waste your college degree, put it to good use. It is hard to resist that kind of pressure. I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it. And I guess I would say try if possible 
to find something where there's some balance. I guess it ties into the previous question where you're doing a job that will pay your bills and will give you some level of satisfaction. Because I, I, I mean, probably most of us have ended up doing some kind of a job that we didn't necessarily love. But because of the kind of education that our kids are getting, they're really in a privileged position, I suspect, to be able to have the kinds of networks and have the kinds of opportunities where they can get enough of both, where they're doing something that's respectable, that will make the parents happy. And I'm on Brooks about some of this also. <laughs> Is something respectable and credible as a job that's not wasting all that nice high-powered education, but where you can actually make a meaningful difference. And if it's not possible, then that's why you have time after working on weekends. And when you're 22, 23, 24, you've got energy for days. So you're a teaching all day. I was a teacher for many years as a professor completely. So I, I think they can do both. They can get the respectable job and they can do stuff on the weekends and in the evenings. Keep mommy and daddy happy. Thank you. Twaldo, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, uh, I have always been wondering uh, what's missing. Developing countries are still developing countries. Developed countries are where and are developing. Developed countries, what's missing in your opinion? Two, do you think those um, developing countries would much benefit more if projects like yours were to focus more on capacity building, conflict resolutions for the youth, then they will have a useful um, future and a very peaceful and respectful society where they are. Plus, uh, I'm saying this because you felt some of the policies, for example, uh, education minister somewhere and in a road, but after building that beautiful school, give it 10 or 20 years, you see some bombs dropped in there. But if you were to build in more of conflict resolutions, sharing the resources that they have, do you think they would be benefited more if you, if Projects like yours where it focus more on uh, respectful dialogue amongst the young uh, generation of these developing countries. So you're, you're asking big, 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 big questions. So let me take the second part of your question first. So when we work in a country, we work only at the invitation of a president or prime minister, and we work only on the priorities that the president has set. We don't go in and say, you should do this, this, and this. The president will say, I want help on these four areas. We say, fine. We will embed advisors and we work only with and through local counterparts and we take the lead from them. And that's about coaching, mutual support, and pushing through bottlenecks to get big things done. The youth might be 30% of the present, but they're 100% of the future. So I agree with you that an emphasis on training up the next generation, dealing with issues of conflict, especially in societies where you have ethnic divisions, regional divisions, one religious divisions, 100%. That definitely has to be part of it. In terms of the big first part of your question. I think there are a number of issues that are in the province of developing countries and in the province of the international system that we're operating in. Governance is getting better, but it's still an issue. We have seen countries move from being the poorest to being middle income. So we talk about, for example, some of the African lions. So I've done work in Ethiopia, which has been making a lot of progress. Now it's experiencing some violence. Hopefully that can get gripped. I know exactly what you're talking about. We did a great project with them on helping the government create a digitally enabled economic 
economically economic inclusive strategy. Hopefully it, 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 the violence stops and it takes. I don't know that we're in the era where we're going to be able to see developing countries go up the ladder as quickly and as easily as the first round. And as North Atlantic and East Asian countries have developed, the rules of the game in terms of trading and protectionism, all those things have changed in ways that do make it more difficult for developing countries. I think that we need to ask deeper questions about what we mean by development. And I think we're going to be moving into a different kind of conversation, which is you've got so much wealth and stuff in the global north and the conversation about climate change and Southern countries saying, well, you all polluted the environment. We need to do that too, because that's how we're going to develop. Well, no, we all need to do climate change. I think we need a different conversation about what wealth means, what development means, how much enough is, if there's going to be a planet that's around for our children. And I'm not trying to be radical, but I think the data are pretty clear that we are on an unsustainable path, whether we like to consume or not. I like to consume. I'm talking about me. I'm part of the problem. And I think if we don't get on a different developmental trajectory, there's not going to be any conversation to have because we're not going to have a planet for our kids. So I think that those, those deeper questions are the kinds of issues that I think we need to talk about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it, it has to be said and we, we do need to consider it. Um, Octavia, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just thank you for your presentation. Um, and I wanted to ask, because I know that you mentioned sustainability in developing countries and how it's difficult because when you don't have access to those more sustainable options, it can be difficult because you just have to sort of like make the choice of picking the I guess, less sustainable options. And I was just wondering like how you or how this has been like combated or, or what types of solutions you've sort of found f to this problem of like the inaccessible uh, sustainable options. You mean in developing in the global South or? Um, yeah, just in, in those developing countries, like you were saying, some countries in Africa, how in development, like for, uh, like you having to use coal and oil um, as opposed to more sustainable options just because of uh, lack of mm -hmm. access? So the good news, there is good news. The good news is that the, the main, apart from talking about COVID because it is what it is, what we're hearing from a lot of leaders all over Africa and other developing regions is about climate adaptation because it's in their face. The soil is eroding. They're not having the same agricultural yields. There are more mudslides. There are more climate events that are driving small producers out that are creating water and airborne, waterborne disease. There are locusts, all this craziness, all connected to climate change. And so the number one thing apart from COVID that we're hearing about is, how can we make our economies resilient by using clean and green technology? How can we move away from coal and dirty power plants to wind and solar and smart off-grids? How can we use technology to reduce the carbon footprint and green our economies? How can we not focus on exploiting oil and gas resources? So that is a very, very current conversation and that that makes me feel hopeful that the leaders have have clocked it because it's in their faces all the time and they're not going to have a country unless they get to grips with it so they are working on different ways to leverage what they have to adapt climate change and to address it so that does give me hope and a lot of this is being led by the next generation which is is definitely cause for hope and celebration so those kinds of things are happening, which is good. Thank That's you. Yeah. yeah. Right, so it's very confusing. I know I've got um, two more hands that are raised and a couple of questions in the chat and I wanna to get to everybody as well. So Farah, would you like to answer your question and then Daniel, 
up to you and then I'll ask the questions in the chat as well. I was just going to highlight a question in the chat because I thought it was something I think too as well. Um, what kinds of opportunities do you suggest um, when referring students to social justice with the understanding that a lot of the way charities and, and these things are set up are quite are not really serving justice in a, in a greater sense? I think the, the facile, but I think true response for me is if it's not done right, it's an opportunity for you to do it right. So I think the good news is that, well, the bad news is that there's so much stuff that's messed up, <laughs> that there's lots of scope for students with support to take the initiative to start things. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be negative. It depends on the organization. Once an organization is set, it's very, very difficult to bring change. Reform is possible. You have to have the kind of leadership that's really self-evaluating and self-reflective and is willing to take critiques on board no matter what the cost, because that means real change. If you can find that kind of an organization where people are willing to learn and grow and really take those kinds of critiques on board, fantastic. If not, then consider what action you can take and what you can do to develop institutions with, that will do it better. I mean, it's not the best answer, but it's, it's, actually, it's actually what I think. There's a question that probably coincides a little bit with, with what you're saying in in terms of sometimes it seems like one person can't make a difference, but what would you say to a student who wonders whether it really make if wonders whether it really makes a difference to start a small campaign in school, for example? Oh my gosh, it totally, 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 totally makes a difference. One person's action is everything. Let me give you a concrete example from your generation the Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg, she sat outside, she sat in the hallway, and then she sat outside her school by herself, being ridiculed and ignored and poo-pooed every day. I think the woman sat outside the school and on the floor for like a year. And look at what's happened now. She's one person, and she started off by herself. Or, Rosa Parks was tired. The grade 10 kids. She's tired. I'm not, I'm not giving up my seat. I'm sitting here. And look at what happened with those Montgomery boycotts. One person can make a huge difference. Never poo-poo or what is it? A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Maybe it'll blow up into something big, maybe it won't. But the experience will be valuable for you because you will have learned, you will have made some mistakes, you will have gotten some things right, you will have discovered whether or not it's an issue that matters to you and you want to pursue. Maybe you will evangelize and convert other people to the cause. Maybe someone else will say, well, gee, she did it. Looks kind of interesting. Maybe I do want to get involved. You just don't know. So don't be discouraged if you're doing something by yourself. Don't be discouraged if you have an idea. Step up, take a risk, take a chance, see who's open, find out who your allies can be, get support. Don't worry about the big picture in terms of where it's going. Start small, start with where you are and see where it takes you. But never ever think that one person can't make a difference because that is definitely not true. I'm going to um, paint in that and then steal it and use it all the time. Thank you, Eva. Um, sure. Daniel, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, very good question. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you, uh, Eva, for your trajectory and uh, all the work you've been doing. It's very contagious the way you speak about it. Um, but my question yeah. is, in, is following up on what they asked earlier. You know, the younger generations, in Africa in particular, 
are critical of aid in general. They see it as a kind of ban, and it, they feel that there are too many things attached to it. The other issue also that they contest very often is the fact that organizations that work with their leaders miss the point to a certain extent because of the extent of corruption and many other situations. So what I want to ask you is, what can you say to these younger Africans who are looking for real capacity building, considering the size of that population, the needs they have, and the fact that they're looking for real change from an economical standpoint, uh, also politically, of course. So, on the positive side, a number of African countries are saying, we want to be free of foreign aid. So the government of Ghana, Nana Double, we call them Nana Double A, uh, Kufo, has made it a commitment to be free of foreign aid. Rwanda similarly wants to move away from foreign aid. We'll see what happens with Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is modeling itself after Rwanda and Singapore wanting to be free of aid. So there are some African leaders that recognize mm, aid's not all it's cracked up to be. And that's because they want independence from the West and independence from China, which is, as you know, a big player in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think one of the things that makes me hopeful when I travel to the continent and I see smart, hard-driving, hungry, talented young Africans is the fact that this technological revolution is their friend. So the ability to access online learning, I can't tell you how many I've met who've gone to some YouTube thing or some online thing and they've taught themselves the code. Now they've got some big tech gig and they're all over Upwork and they're making money and they're hiring others and they're doing web apps and they're bootleg jack booting stuff. I mean, lots of innovation. And I think I'm hopeful about what I see in terms of the raw talent. In terms of the capacity issue, <clears throat> there is a lot of reform and restructuring that needs to happen with education at the primary school and at the secondary level. And what I also see that makes me hopeful is that because there really has been some progress over the last generation, I do see that there are many highly educated Africans that are going back home because there are opportunities that are opening up. Now, it's not easy all the time, but I do see more than a trickle of those who've been educated in Paris and in London and in Canada, the United States, who say, you know what, I wanna take my talents back home and build. It's not at scale, it's not enough, but I do think that in general, I do see movements, not in every country, but in a number of, of important countries, I do see some movement in the right direction. I agree that aid has its benefits, but it also has a lot of limits. And so the extent to which there are agendas being set to become self-sufficient through domestic resource mobilization, I think that's to the good. But it's not a full answer, but it's a partial answer. In the right direction. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Ava. You have given me much consideration and thought and this was a very thought-provoking and inspiring speech so thank you for starting off our guests speaker series and I'll definitely be picking your brains in a one-to-one -one session so thank you. Well, thank you so much for for asking me I'm really very honored and very flattered and uh, was really very excited to be able to do this so I'm I'm grateful to you and grateful that Halcyon is putting together something like this. And I'm excited to see what our students, our kids will do. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye-bye.